Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces today. Exciting stuff. First up, Citibank executive says Bitcoin will trade at $318,000 by the end of 2021. And at first glance, it looks pretty ridiculous, but we've already talked about this in a previous video called 500k Bitcoin, and the results aren't that far off. Also, pretty good article on Cointelegraph talks about Bitcoin chose decentralization and immutability over payments, says Fidelity executives. This is a great piece because it goes over the six misconceptions about Bitcoin. But there is one thing. Bitcoin is not great for everyday use. And more great news. SEC Jay Clayton Head will step down as a U.S. SEC chair by the year's end. And I got to tell you, it doesn't get more bullish than that. Lastly, we'll go over Q of the Day where I talk about Celsius being a scam and what I said on Twitter. So again, all that great stuff. First, get over what's going on in the markets today. It is 10 a.m. getting started early, Monday, November 16th. And uh, usually Sundays aren't that great for crypto because things start to take little dips as people take profits and trade out and do all their little magic. But uh, on Monday, we start to see a little bit of rebound. And today, it is no different. And it's a great Monday because Bitcoin, 2.6%, almost at 16 and a half. Uh, maybe we can hit 17K. Who knows? Quite the rally the last month. It's been up uh, 6% for seven days. So uh, all you Bitcoin holders, whoever you are, me, me and myself and I, uh, congratulations. Did pretty good. Ethereum up 0.6 at 458. I was watching Hashoshi and he was talking about how Ethereum 2.0 may be delayed. Uh, it's an interesting piece. I just watched a snippet of it. Smart guy. And uh, he just talks about how they want a certain percentage or a certain number of Ethereum to be staked. And right now, it's only 10% of the total uh, that they actually need or want. So uh, go ahead and check that out. But uh, I'm like, oof, that's never good for Ethereum. They're talking about delays yet again. Anyhow, Tether, almost at 18 billion. So great. Tether's printing money like crazy xrp hey look xrp almost hit my hit 30 cents uh you know 11 for seven days so congratulations xrp holders uh looks like you're really up and uh yeah chain link two percent litecoin is the big winner for today 13 percent up uh 16 for seven days i think people are just getting warming up to the the talk about what litecoin is how it fits into the whole paypal process and uh, people are actually getting into it because really if you take a look at it uh bitcoin bitcoin cash and ethereum litecoin is the cheapest one so if you're looking at getting the cryptocurrency this is the same thing that people talked about in 2017 well if everything's going up why not just pick the cheaper one because maybe that'll be the next bitcoin and maybe that's why people are picking up litecoin who knows uh bitcoin cash up three two and a half percent for usd coin let's go down let's uh see what really 7.4 percent for a what ethereum classic Pfft, have fun with that look if you're a fan of ethereum Classic, that's great but uh i think they've had three 51 percent attacks i'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole let's see ways is up 12 percent congratulations waves holders i've heard good things about them need to do some research uh, looks great eight percent for doge whoever holds doge congratulations i like that project i think it works pretty well started off as a joke but uh really it uh, does pretty good things Let's see, 2.4 for, hey, Digibyte, the thing that I really need to do a video on, I never, always talk about, never do. Digibyte, congratulations. 11% for Zillica. If you don't know, Zillica is uh, doing staking right now, and the staking uh, percentage is like super high. I think it's like 22 or 29%, something crazy. Uh, Dave over at uh, Crazy for Cryptos talks about it all the time, and uh, maybe it's something I should take a look at. Qtum. What? Quant 5.8%. That's great. Hedera Hashgraph. You don't know Hedera Dashgraph. It is one of those like super smart uh, type of projects that people should really take a look at and really get into. I don't know if it could be the next big thing, but uh, the prospect of what it could do is pretty powerful. It's just uh, seeing if it actually do it. And again, uh, as far as like uh, businesses go, you can have the best product in the world, but it doesn't matter unless people actually use it and want it. Look at McDonald's. It's the worst place to eat of all time yet it serves billions every day so let that sink in uh sushi 123 percent for seven days what the hell is going on 12 percent up uh yeah have fun with that see if that crashes again and that's really all we're what hey empty set dollar i don't know what that is 17 percent 16 percent who knows i don't know uh elron people talk about how great it is it could be uh, looks like another smart project again let's see if it can actually make it but again a lot of good businesses don't make it even though they've got a great product and curve dow token 6.3 so that's your top 100 let's jump into today's top stories so first up this is good uh citibank exec says bitcoin will trade at 318,000 
by uh, the end of 2021. So <laughs> if you're holding Bitcoin, 2021 could be could be your year. Look, I don't know if that's what it's going to be, but I can tell everybody that 2021 is definitely going to be a great year for crypto and digital assets. I could be wrong, but I felt that for quite some time, and we'll see if it actually plays out. But I think, it, I think it's going to be. So writing a report titled Bitcoin 21st Century, uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, the author, makes the surge argument for Bitcoin. He says the digital gold's current trajectory appears to be similar to that of gold in the 1970s. I'm a big fan of history, and I kind of think like what happens before is going to repeat and happen again. So this was interesting to me. He states, before structural changes were implemented in the early 70s, gold had spent 50 years of trading in the $20 to $35 range. I did not know that. Interesting. However, after changes were instituted, gold surged. It recently touched a new all-time high in August of around 1900 per ounce. So imagine you have in 2035, what well, we're talking about 30, 40 years ago, and now we're looking at $1,900. So, I mean, given inflation and everything else, I mean, you can put that into account, but still, it's a, it's a marvelous run for uh, for gold and all the gold bugs. No wonder they're always talking about it. But do you really think gold can go 10X and go from 2000 to 20,000? No, there's not a chance in hell it's gonna happen. So I could be wrong, uh, let me know in the comment section, but I don't see that ever happening unless there's like massive inflation, but who knows? Uh, states with the COVID-19 pandemic still hemorrhaging economies around the world, governments will continue to uh, responding to the crisis by printing more money. This in turn will benefit safe haven assets, which perform well in inflationary periods. So uh, spoiler alert, uh, they're going to keep printing. And also with uh, Joe Biden as a president elect, if you uh, think that uh, Trump still has a chance, sure, whatever. Um, but uh, if you think that uh, Biden won't keep printing money and then the Federal Reserve won't keep printing, you're delusional. Uh, it's going to be money printing out the wazoo, and we're going to see a ton of money come into play. And uh, we'll see how it all works out. But uh, again, as money gets printed, it really benefits the top because the top people now have all this money. And then when it gets disseminated into the lower class, uh, to the middle, upper middle, middle, lower class, uh, that's when it starts to depreciate. So I don't think this is going to be good for uh, uh, the economy uh, in the long term. Short term, yeah, I mean, we need a little stimulus, especially with COVID-19 coming back, roaring the life. Uh, I'll be going back to El Paso in a couple of weeks. We'll see how that works out. The hotbed, the hottest place in the country with coronavirus, but uh, got to go back. So we'll see. But again, printing money is good for gold, silver, digital assets, cryptocurrency. And Fitzpatrick notes this. Gold has restrictions such as storage, non-portable, and can possibly be even called yesterday's news in terms of a financial hedge. Bitcoin is the new gold. Bitcoin is digital gold. It's finite, only 21 million. We're not going to find more Bitcoin. We're going to find a lot more gold as time goes on. We're not going to find more Bitcoin. I can send it to anyone anywhere in the world for in less than 30 minutes for next to nothing. Also, it's the best performing asset class ever. It's uh, outperformed all stocks, oil, gold, silver, ever. So uh, it used to cost a penny or a nickel. Now it costs uh, almost 17000 That's why I'm heavily invested. And that's my Bitcoin elevator pitch. Anyhow, to support his view, Fitzpatrick says the same thing that I say, which is limited supply, ease of movement across borders, and opaque ownership. Or you can see who owns it quite easily by just taking a look at the blockchain. Consequently, Fitzpatrick believes more investors will choose Bitcoin over gold as a result. And I believe that to be true. And it'll take some time uh, because really all the wealth in America, I don't know how it works out in the rest of the world. I assume it's the same way, but it's in the hands of the older population. We call them the baby boomers here. Matter of fact, they have uh, the vast lion's share. So this is the percentage of U.S. household wealth by age of generations median uh, cohort or what they actually own. So you got millennials uh, not looking too hot. Gen Xers, eh, not too bad. Baby boomers, far and away the biggest. But uh, so they are the older generation. They are used to what they are used to, which is gold and silver, so on and so forth, stocks. So uh, they're going to hold on to that. But as time goes on, it'll flip over to Bitcoin. It just only makes sense. Now to finish up, unlike other digital currencies, such as central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, Bitcoin cannot be confiscated therefore making it a more secure asset. Also, CBDCs are centralized, so uh, you can shut them down at any time. So that's what we got for that one. Pretty interesting piece there. But again, uh, check out that, that video on uh, 500K Bitcoin. Uh, one of the things that we took a look at was uh, the circulating supply and the market cap and what the actual market cap would be 
uh, for 500,000. It really came out, it came out to nine and a half trillion dollars, which seems like a lot. But if you take a look at the um, global amount of money, uh, just gold itself has 12 trillion. Uh, so I'm just saying, if it just eats up a little bit of uh, gold, a little bit of currency, a little bit of tokenization, a little bit of store of value, uh, just take put this all together and 500,000 is not that far away. So uh, before I was like, that's ridiculous. But now I'm like, that seems okay. I, I have a conservative view of uh, 150,000, but anywhere from 150,000 to 500K, hey, I'm still pretty happy. Let me understand in the comments section. Let's move on. Next up, Bitcoin chose decentralization and immutability over payments, says Fidelity. This is a really good article where if you really want to get into the meat and potatoes of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin, this is really good. And it it's uh it lays bare some interesting points and some things that people have uh you know held to, which are wholly false. So uh the first one is this: Bitcoin has failed as a means of payment. I know I will get crucified in the comment section, but it has. Uh you can't use it as payment. Have you tried to use it as payment uh, everywhere? I mean, right now, I think maybe you get away with it for small things, but first of all, why would you want to? Like just as we just took a look at uh, before, uh, take a look at what Bitcoin is or where it's at now and where it could be. Why would you use it as currency? It doesn't make any sense. And then also, as more people start to buy into it and get into it, especially 2021, uh, it'll be the same thing as like 2017, which I always talk about. Uh, it gets super slow. It gets super expensive. Transactions per second are like minimal. So again, uh, it's not a means of payment. It just isn't. It's, it could be a store of value. And that's why I think people are buying it up. Uh, but I don't see it as a means of payment. Uh, let me know where I'm wrong uh, in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, let's keep going. So the currency is outperformed, Fidelity accepts, by conventional payment rails like Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal, all of which can offer high throughput. And when they say throughput, it just means transactions per second or TPS. And what they're talking about here is when you run your Visa or your MasterCard or debit card or whatever else, uh, how much can it actually process uh, per second. And this is the, an, an older chart, but it still holds true today, uh, roughly. So Bitcoin has between uh, about 7 to 12. So 7 to 12 transactions per second. Uh, Ethereum 20 dash uh, at a blazing 48. Litecoin, hey, this may be one of the reasons why it's going up. It's at 56. So pretty good. Bitcoin Cash is doing pretty good here at 60. So that's what their, their whole... Uh, argument is like hey we're here for currency and we have 60 transactions per second sure paypal 193 all right ripple has 1500 and it should be xrp i don't know why it says ripple but uh, it's an old <laughs> it's an old one and then visa is at 24,000. visa has also claimed 150,000 at one point so we'll just average it out maybe it's at 50,000. but just to look at transactions per second uh, that's a lot and for Bitcoin to, to hold up, it's not going to happen right now. I know people will talk about secular. What about the Lightning Network? Well, uh, it doesn't work that hot right now. So maybe in the future, just not right now, it can't hold up. If everybody in the world used Bitcoin, it would crash in a heartbeat. Forget the world. Just, let's, let's talk about like one nation. So uh, let's just take Canada. If Canada did, it would crash. So moving down, there's another thing that uh, I failed to mention, which was Bitcoin's tax definition as property in some jurisdictions, meaning that users have to calculate gains and losses for every payment or purchase in Bitcoin, renders it impractical for many payments. So that's another thing. So if you really wanted to use uh, Bitcoin everyday purposes, uh, you would have to calculate that for taxes as losses and gains at the time. So let's say you bought today at 16.5 or whatever it is. And then uh, later on today, you buy some coffee or you buy a car. I don't know what you're buying. And uh, now Bitcoin is at 16.7. Well, uh, for, I mean, I guess a car will be okay because it's not like you're going to buy a car every day. But for everyday use, you'd have to calculate every single transaction you would do. And then you would have to put it into uh, the IRS or wherever you're at, Canada central government. So again, this wouldn't really work out. I mean, you could if you really like to do your taxes that much. I don't like, I hate doing taxes, but I have to. Further on, it states uh, the coin's design has prioritized, prioritized aspects such as decentralization, finite supply, 21 million, and immutable settlement, meaning you can't change it because there's so many nodes. There's thousands, I think there's like now tens of thousands of nodes throughout the globe. So uh, you can't change them because they are on each node and they will find out if you try to not to, to do that. So uh, that's the whole thing about immutability. Also, no central bank or government can step in to support or prop up markets and artificially subdue volatility. So that's what's great about uh, Bitcoin. They can't step in and prop up the markets like the Federal Reserve is doing right now with 
the traditional market or the stock market uh, that is propped up totally uh, solely by the Federal Reserve. If they weren't injecting so many things and buying so many things, it would have crashed a long time ago. Bitcoin's volatility is a trade-off for distortion-free market. True price discovery accompanied by volatility might be preferable to artificially or artificial stability if it results in distorted markets that may break down without intervention. So really what they're trying to say here is that this, that there's going to be volatility until we discover exactly what the value of Bitcoin is. There's some price discovery going on right now. Is it is Bitcoin worth 3,000 uh, US dollars or is it worth 500,000 US dollars? Well, we'll figure it out. And uh, as time moves on, there will be less volatility. Just right now, expect volatility. Let's just be honest. It's going to be uh, pretty big. Like what? In March, uh, just uh, eight months ago, we were at below 4,000. Today, we're almost going to hit 17. So I would think that's a little bit of volatility. So those are just my thoughts on that one. And then it goes on to say that there's a couple more things in the report, but it didn't mention here. So I was like, well, what are those things? Because I want to know. The things we just talked about were interesting, but there was three more criticism. I think four, actually. And Chris, number three is that Bitcoin is wasteful. This is exactly what uh, Brad Garlinghouse, of uh, uh, the CEO of Ripple states. He says, hey, uh, Bitcoin is super wasteful. And when Joe Biden comes in, he's going to clamp that down because uh, they did not like to uh, have uh, waste or they try trying to do renewable sources. Well, here's the response. A substantial portion of Bitcoin mining is powered by renewable energy or energy that would otherwise be wasted. Uh, additionally, the energy that bank Bitcoin network does consume is valid and poor. So at first people were like, okay, well, what's the number? So here's the numbers. The Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, or CCAF, estimates 76% of miners use renewables, especially hydroelectric power, as part of their energy mix. So if you're looking at uh, where mining pools are, uh, they're mostly in China. Not that the miners themselves or the mining rigs are in China, the mining pools. And a lot of those pools, they are uh, using renewable energy such as hydroelectric power. On top of that, you've got layer one in West Texas, and they are going to be doing a massive amount of uh, Bitcoin mining. And why is it in West Texas? Because uh, renewable energy is super cheap because it's super windy, and that is renewable energy source. So that's another uh, prospect of that. And there's some, and there's a new piece I had no idea about. It says more recently mining operations have been set up to power Bitcoin mining with stranded gas. I'm like, what the heck is that? So stranded gas is a natural gas that has limited utility and is likely to be wasted in oil or gas while it does not have the pipeline infrastructure needed to transport the gas is considered standard. Stranded gas is flared or burned in the air or vented, allowing to escape in the air. And that's when you see like in the uh, the mining rigs where like, there's just a big blow off, uh, stranded gas, sure, sure. So they're using something like that, which will already be wasted, which pollutes anyhow. So, I mean, you're gonna pollute, but in all honesty, uh, Bitcoin is still gonna be a little bit of wasteful and that's what they talk about here. So they are gonna use non-renewable energy sources, but uh, it is what it is. So. When people start to talk about like, well, it's super wasteful and it's 100% and just use dirty coal, debatable. And this is one of the reasons why. So another one was Bitcoin is used for illicit activity. This is just stupid. I'm not going to go too much in this, but it states as a share of total transactions, Bitcoin transactions connected to illicit activity are very low. Of course, we all know that uh, the, the number one currency used for illicit activity is the US dollar. So uh, just that's what it is. Chris is number five, Bitcoin is not backed by anything. And this is what you're going to hear when you start to talk about your friends and family, especially in 2021 when Bitcoin really explodes. So they're going to say, hold on, Bitcoin's not, it's not uh, backed by the U.S. government. It uh, it has no utility. So it's just made out of nothing. You're like, no, no, no. It's Bitcoin is backed or Bitcoin is value because we say it has value. Gold isn't backed by the U.S. government, but yet it still has value. Diamonds don't really have utility. They just look good in a ring, but they still have value. Your digital movies and games that even that gamers play in their uh, specified games, they have value and yet they don't really exist. So when you talk about Bitcoin not having value, so what else you got? Bitcoin has value because we say it has value. And for all the things that we talked about, it is permissionless, it is decentralized, it is immutable, it is transferable, it is finite. These are the reasons why. And also, we have a consensus and we give it value because we say it is. And it's not just me and you that give it value. There's millions of people around the globe that says it has value. So there it is. And lastly, Bitcoin will be replaced by a competitor. This is the biggest one that I think that I get on the channel. Well, Bitcoin is old and slow and, and it's the Netscape navigator of browsers. Let's just upgrade to Google Chrome. And it's a valid point, actually, because really, if you think about it, uh, Bitcoin is old. It's like 13 years old and it is slow. We just talked about how slow it was. But 
one good thing about about being old is it's battle tested and when you're going to invest into something uh, sometimes you don't want the newest and greatest and latest things those are for like the super early adopters when people want to look at like what is a little bit more stable well this has been around for over a decade and it hasn't been hacked it looks pretty good and then also an, another uh, criticism is well we can just fork a fork a fork of a fork and we just get some more bitcoin we can get bitcoin tomato or whatever it doesn't matter but uh, the whole thing is that well yes you can uh, fork it, it's an open source software, but a fork of a fork is about to happen, or just did happen actually. I think Bitcoin Cash just forked. I don't think ABC is gonna last, but whatever. Uh, but it's that's not the point. It's the community and the network effects. It cannot be altered. So even though that we can have Bitcoin and then Bitcoin Cash, when you get to Bitcoin Diamond and Bitcoin Potato and Bitcoin Possum, uh, those don't exist. I mean, well, one of them actually does exist and just kind of went away. So it all depends on what actually has value, what has utility, what has use, and what people say has value. So let me just think in the comment section. Let's move on. Next up, and I'll make this very quick. Uh, this is a good day. <laughs> this is a good day. I, not that I have anything against Jay Clayton. I'm sure he's a nice guy, family man, sure. But doesn't like uh, cryptocurrency, and that's not good for me. And if that's not good for me and you, why do we want him in there? So Jay Clayton will step down as USC chair by the year's end. That's great. Hopefully we can get uh, uh, Hester Pierce, uh, crypto mom, in there, and she can be the new chair. That would be awesome. So Jay Clayton will be leaving the agency by the end of 2021. And when I read this, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. By the end of 2021 or the beginning? Because... <clears throat> this doesn't make any sense. Year's end. Well, I guess that is the year's end. So I had to take a look and just double check. Over on CNBC, it says Jay Clayton says he will step down early as head of the SEC at the end of 2020. So we're looking at uh, two months, a month and a half. So when I first read this, I'm like, ah, oh, that sucks. That's like another year and a half or a year and some change. But no, it's going to happen quickly. And that's good for us. As chairman, just a little bit of a history. Clayton also warned that Bitcoin investors last year that they would be sorely mistaken in expecting the crypto should be traded on mainstream exchanges without more robust regulation in place and pretty much would just poo-poo all over it. Not every chance he gets, but uh, he wasn't a really big fan. So it was kind of shocking when the SEC came out and said, hey, we're going to allow banks and all these other authorities and everybody really to be custodians of Bitcoin. So big institutions can now be their own uh, custodians. And I thought it was interesting because I'm like, wow, that's a kind of a reversal of what they uh, were really planning on. So that's the, so we have the SEC saying they can be custodians. We have the OCC saying they, they can be custodians. And then, and then we got the banks in the middle going, <laughs> we're not innovators. We're not going to do that. But it just goes to show you that it is good that uh, these governmental agencies can actually be a little more forward thinking. Banks, eh, what are you going to do? So really, that's it. And the article doesn't talk about who is going to replace him. Uh, it does talk about where Jay's going to go, which I really don't care. Uh, but who's going to replace him is the big question. So let me know who you think could or should replace him in the comments section. Let's move on to our last piece, which is Q of the Day. So in Q of the Day, I had sent out a couple of tweets, which was, this was the uh, Leia Helpern show. And she asked a great question to Alex. She says, how can crypto companies pay 10% interest? when banks are offering practically nothing. And Alex answered the question, kinda. I mean, he pretty much says that banks can make 17%. They don't give you guys squat, but we give you guys uh, a lot. So I just said, hey, is Celsius a scam? To like have people who think it's a scam watch and go, oh, it's, you know, seems legit. So then, uh, then people were like, oh, so what, you think it's a scam? I'm like, did you watch the video? So then I had to clarify it and said, hey, do I think Celsius is a scam? No. And have there been some errors? Yeah, there have been. So this was really the big question, and I want to really clarify some things about why I still have taken my portfolio from 30% in Celsius down to 10%. So let's jump in. All right, everybody, welcome back to Q of the Day. And this was a good one. This was uh, something that I had talked about in my previous video where I talked about Celsius Network and my plans. And if you don't uh, know what it was, I'll just give you a quick recap. Uh, Celsius, they had a switchover. They did a uh, what's called a DNS propagation where they had to upgrade their services on GoDaddy. So when you do that for DNS propagation, uh, sometimes it takes 24 hours, sometimes it takes 72 hours. I've done that on both of my websites and it took about you know 24 to 36, but it is kind of harrowing because everything goes down and they tell you it's gonna go down so you can let your customers or members know. So me personally, when I went to upgrade, they said, hey, it's going to be, it's not going to have access for quite some time. So you need to tell everybody. Sure. So I told everybody uh, one week out, 
five days out, three, two, one. The day of, 36 hours afterwards, when it was up, and then of course, ask, answer any questions. And that's just me being a small business owner. So when I saw what Celsius did, I was a little bit concerned because they are a multi-billion dollar company. So I don't, look, I will just say this, no company is 100% perfect, right? Uh, there's nobody that is uh, infallible. But for me, when I looked at this, I'm like, well, it's kind of a big mistake. And it's one of those mistakes that they shouldn't have made. And, uh, and if nobody told them at GoDaddy that this would happen, it doesn't really matter because the people that are required or actually are there to change everything over, um, they should know these things. And then also as far as like the security team, because you know, it's so one of those things as far as security and, and customer information, uh, they should also be, have been, uh, are aware of, of what actually happened. And I know people will say, well, it doesn't really matter because it's not, uh, the cryptocurrency isn't on the website. It's not on the app. It's on the blockchain. That is all true. However, uh, you don't want some kind of data leak going on, and uh, which is what happened with other companies. So as far as the security team, of course, they were involved and they did the right thing. They didn't open it up very quickly. However, I think they should have known. So it's just one of those things where it's a, um, it's a breach in trust. That's all it is. And uh, some of the, so when I said uh, on yesterday's video, I was going to uh, decrease my portfolio in Celsius, uh, people were not too happy with me because they're like, well, how can you do that? And you should really believe in that. And and this is, uh, you know, just a little glitch. So not a big deal. I'm like, wait, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what I do. If I do something like that, then that's just me and uh, what my thoughts are. That does not affect you. Um, so if you want to keep uh, 100% of your cryptocurrency assets, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. But for me, I thought, I just really thought back and go, you know, 30% is kind of a high number to, to keep on any one centralized uh, platform because uh, you never know. And then some people say, well, it's DeFi. It's not DeFi. It's centralized finance. That's exact. And even Alex Mashinsky will say it's centralized finance. And uh, yes, there is uh, in insurance through uh, Celsius, uh, but it is uh, uh, FDIC insured for your fiat. And when your uh, cryptocurrency is there, then they also have a form of insurance. However, when they lend it out, which is the whole platform, and Alex will tell you this as well, when they lend out that uh, cryptocurrency, uh, there is no insurance. So if something happens and that's it, now they do ask for collateral and that's great. So like if you wanna borrow a hundred bucks, you gotta give 150 bucks. Uh, well, essentially that's really how it is. Um, but we have seen instances where other places have said the same thing. We have collateral and uh, all of a sudden just didn't really work out. Now there is one bright spot I will say about this, not one, uh, Celsius is probably far, far and away the best out there that I've seen. And I know people will say, well, what about X and what about Y and what about Z? I don't know about X, Y, and Z. And uh, the ones that I've looked at uh, are not that great. So when we uh, take a look at the history of what has happened, we can, all you have to do is look back to March when the whole pandemic started and there was a huge crash for uh, Bitcoin, and all the crypto assets out there. And during that time, uh, there was a, and this is the whole trouble that started with cred. Once that happened, uh, people were like, we can't pay back the loans because we are overextended here and overextended there and it became a huge mess. So with Celsius, that didn't happen. Um, they said, well, we have you know, the, the collateral. And unfortunately at that time, the crypto collateral went down so far, they're like, hey, I uh, either have to you know, pay back the loan or you have to start collateralizing more so you can keep the loan. And out of all those things that happened, they only had to uh, uh, liquidate either three or four people, I forgot how much it was, but it was a very low number. And that is kind of like your benchmark as to you know, how well a company can do. I mean, every, everybody's awesome when the money's rolling in and there's no problems whatsoever, okay? Look at Bernie Madoff. It was working pretty great for that whole time. But uh, when, when the uh, waves start to crash or when the uh, tide rolls in, you can see, or the tide rolls out, you can see who uh, is left uh, swimming naked. So it's one of those things where it's like, well, Celsius passed that test and that's one of the bigger tests that I can uh, think of that may or could happen now or in the future. So it's a pretty bright spot. However, going back to my thing, which is 
30% of my entire portfolio on Celsius. Some people say that was a little bit crazy, a little bit too much. Some people say that wasn't enough, but it doesn't matter what uh, other people say. It's what you think and what you do with your money. So for me, I felt like it was a time for a little bit of a cool off period and I uh, reduced from 30% down to 10%. Now, as time goes on and uh, there's no problems and we see more things, then I will probably add back in. I don't see the problem with that. And then will I keep uh, buying the Celsius token? Absolutely. Why wouldn't I? I mean, it's just going to keep going up for, for quite some time, I believe. Now, it could go down, but I believe in the platform and I believe in what Alex is doing. But, um, you know, I just think that it was time to just uh, do a cool down and a pull back. And uh, this is where I'm at. So hopefully I answer your question uh, for today. Let's, uh, let's All right, jump. That's it. So I hope that answers uh, some questions for you about Celsius. Uh, also, just a quick reminder, Dan Teaches Crypto, the free website is up. And again, we try to simplify everything as far as uh, what is crypto, what is crypto good for, uh, some different investment strategies, not that it's investment advice, but just kind of like the basic things that uh, I find important and uh, things that I think you could actually find important as well. So if you're looking for like the basics uh, type of thing, this is probably the best place to go, on my personal opinion. It's danteachescrypto.com and there is a link in the description and that is it for today. So if you like those types of videos, there's gonna be too much gonna pop up on your left and right, let uh, YouTube do its magic. And that is essentially it for today. So thanks for stopping by. Really appreciate it. And then I'll see you on the next one.